final talk this morning is by Eugene Chang, who will be talking about planetesimal formation. I'll take two minutes. It's not switching over. Oh, I oh, got it. Thanks. OK, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to give a talk. Um, in any course in introductory astronomy, a popular subject is tidal disruption. In the context of black holes, this is called spaghettification. But of course, one can always go in the opposite direction, and this is the hope of gravitational instability as a form, as a way to form stars or planets, or maybe even planetesimals. The hope is that you can take a collection of spaghettified dust particles whose sizes may be no large, whose individual sizes may be no larger than a centimeter, and somehow glom them together into regions so dense that they can gravitationally collapse and form the first generation planetesimals, whose sizes may be upwards of several kilometers. Um, I always prefer to go this way than to go that way. Um, it doesn't matter which way you're going, though. A useful density to compare against is the Roche density, the density required to resist tidal shear. And it's simply estimated it's the mass of the central object that's trying to tear you to ribbons. Solar mass divided by the distance to that object cubed. So you take a solar mass divided by a few AU cubed, and you find that the Roche density is orders of magnitude above the densities that are usually talked about by theorists and observers. So just for reference, the minimum mass solar nebula falls short of Roche by some two orders of magnitude. And that's just for gas. The situation for dust is even worse. The dust to gas ratio has to increase not by two orders of magnitude, but by four from its starting value, from its diffuse ISM value of 10 to the minus two. So this talk is a progress report on how we might possibly achieve these incredibly dusty conditions approaching Roche. Um, and just for fun, you can estimate for yourself, try to decide for yourself or identify for yourself the sorts of, what, what sort of the, dense, the dustiest conditions you can think of, right? Smoke-filled room, um, violent Saharan dust storm. What are the dust to gas ratios that you can think of here on the Earth and compare it against this value? And I leave that as an exercise for the audience. <laughs> um, here's one way to do it. I think it's quite a promising way. It's called the streaming instability. Two fluid instability. You take gas and you take dust. The gas drags on the dust, the dust back reacts and drags on the gas. So you take these two frictionally coupled fluids in a disk, and this is what Yudin and Goodman did to discover the streaming instability. You write down a dispersion relation for disturbances in that two fluid system, and you always find a growing mode, a mode that tries to concentrate the dust particles um, relative to the gas. It has nothing to do with self-gravity and everything to do with friction. So it's an aerodynamic clumping mechanism. And it's quite powerful. Here in this shearing box simulation, you find that, yeah, whoops. You find that uh, you can get quite strong clumping. The dust to gas ratio approaches values of 30. And you can even go higher. It all depends on what the particle sizes are or more accurately, the particle stopping times. So for any given particle, you can calculate a stopping time. You blow gas across it at some velocity, and you just calculate how long it takes for that particle to come up to speed with the flow, right? to become entrained with the gas. So small particles having large surface area to mass ratios, small particles have short stopping times. And it turns out the streaming instability is most effective, that is the growth rates are strongest when the stopping times are on the order of the orbital time of the disk. Because it turns out the 
the turnover times for the eddies in the turbulence that's driven by the streaming instability, those eddy turnover times are of the order of the orbital time. So when that, dynamic, when that um, stopping time non-dimensionalized, the stopping time relative to the local orbit time, when it's on the order of one, you find dust to gas ratios that are huge, well exceeding Roche. This is good news for uh, planetesimal formation. The bad news, or maybe I should more fairly say, the unanswered question is where these order unity stopping time particles come from. So these actually correspond to rather large um, physical sizes for the particles. So that's this plot here. Um, if you're looking at stopping time on the order of one in this non-dimensional sense, on the order of one, at one AU, you're talking about meter-sized objects. And unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that the disk is able to process the bulk of its solids into meter-sized boulders as a starting point. Right? So it remains to be shown that this is a um, reasonable initial condition from which the streaming instability can take off. But I refer you to a, to a poster, poster by uh, Farzana Maru, where by careful calculation of the velocity distributions of these particles that are trying to stick their way up to a meter, that in fact, by carefully accounting for that velocity distribution, they can get their way up to meters and even, even larger. So I refer you to that recent work. Observationally, there's plenty of evidence for millimeter to centimeter sized things. Whoops, sorry, keep missing the laser pointer. Millimeter to centimeter sized things, which at 1 AU correspond to rather short stopping times on the order of 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4, which the streaming instability has a hard time clumping. Right? So here you've, we've knocked down the uh, stopping time by just a decade from order 1 to order 0.01 to 0.1. You can see that the dust to gas ratios fall below Roche. So this is really a problem um, for the inner disk where gas densities are high particles are still too small to couple, to, to decouple from the gas. And so, um, so this is really a problem for the inner disk. It's not really a problem for the outer disk because those same millimeter to centimeter sized particles, well, they have long stopping times out there where gas densities are low. I should also point out, right, this, this whole idea of trying to concentrate the particles, um, it's using the turbulence, using the turbulence to concentrate particles further. Here, this turbulence is driven by the streaming instability, but you can replace it with your favorite instability. For example, the MRI can also be used to concentrate particles in the fluctuations. Another way to concentrate the particles is not through turbulence, but through vortices. And here, there's this nice poster by Eloise Mayu pointing out that, in fact, vortices can concentrate particles. But again, there is this size selection bias. Right. So it's quite effective at concentrating particles whose stopping times are on the order of unity, but uh, it remains to be shown that it works for anything else. Okay, now I'm going to advance. So here's another way to do it. Another way to do it is to wait, to wait for the dust to drop down to the midplane into a thin, dense sheet. And Dust settles pretty quickly. Millimeter-sized grains drop like a rock in a thousand years down to the midplane if there's no turbulence. And that is the big if, because any whiff of turbulence can stir the particles back up and prevent the dust from reaching these thin, dense sublayers. So just a slide ago, we were using the turbulence to concentrate the particles and enhance the uh, dust density. Here, you see that the turbulence actually hurts us because it prevents the dust from reaching large, mean, average densities. Um, many forms of turbulence, all forms of turbulence are a threat. Um, there's one that's unavoidable, though, and that's the form of turbulence that's driven by the dust layer itself. The turbulence intrinsic to the sublayer is a kelvin helmholtz instability. It occurs because there's a vertical shear across the layer. The layer itself, this dense midplane, wants to travel at the full Keplerian speed, but the gas above and below it is light, it's less dense, it's supported by radial pressure gradients, and so it um, rotates more slowly. So there's a shear, there's a dv dz, 
across the uh, layer. And as the layer shrinks, dz, since we're in Canada, it's z, uh, dz shrinks, and so this shearing frequency, this turnover frequency, uh, increases to the point where it can overturn the layer. So here you have two layers, one thick, one thin, and uh, this dz is smaller here. And so you can pretty much bet, if I press the right button, bang, that this will disrupt in these shearing box simulations, showing that the KHI is alive and well in rotating disks. Okay? So the hope is that before this happens, that planetesimals form before that happens. Okay. All right, so what we've done is we've mapped out uh, the maximum possible dust to gas ratios that the KHI can permit. All right, so this is basically this plot, the dust to gas ratio versus the bulk disk metallicity, the uh, total amount of solids to gas that the entire disk affords. And just to give you one example, one point on this, on this stability line, if you give me a disk which is, which is enriched in metals by a few times over solar, so super solar by roughly a factor of a few, maybe four. I can tell you that this, it is possible for this layer to shrink to the point where the dust to gas ratio right at the heart of the midplane is 30. So pretty dusty. Um, they're, they're incredibly thin and cuspy, these uh, dust layers. The KHI uh, really is only a threat at the tops and bottom surfaces of the layer not surprisingly, because that's where the gradients are steepest. In the heart of the layer, at the very midplane, the gradient is small, and so it remains cage stable, allowing the dust to settle further. Okay, um, of course, you know, this is, this is um, it's still susceptible to other forms of turbulence, in, namely the streaming instability. So it remains to be seen that this sort of outcome is possible, even when you account for the streaming instability but for particles uh, whose stopping times are on the order of 10 to the minus three. That, I think, is where the interesting parameter space is. One thing we've learned in the last year is that um, even if you reach Roche density, uh, it, the game is not over yet. You still have a ways to go. In fact, even if this dust gas mixture, by hook or by crook, I don't know, care how you do it, if you achieve Roche density, it is not true that it just collapses dynamically on a free fall time scale. The layer itself does not just collapse as a whole. It's because it's held up by gas pressure. Um, you take these, at least the biggest clumps are, these big clumps of dust and gas intermixed. If the clump is so big that its sound crossing time, L over C, the sound crossing time across the clump is long compared to the individual particle stopping time. If that's the case, then naturally the dust is well coupled to the gas. You, could, you should really think of it like a suspension, like milk. And the sound speed in milk is slower than that in water because of all the heavy milk particles that are embedded in it. So too, the sound, the effective sound speed in this dust gas suspension is lower because of the added weight from all those solids. So the sound speed is lower. You might think, oh, well, that's good. That's the right sign for you to be genes unstable. You want the sound crossing time to be long. And even though the sound crossing time is long compared to the individual particle stopping time, it is still orders of magnitude shorter than the free fall time, right, at Roche density. So you have this um, somewhat surprising, uh, to me, outcome that these big Roche density suspensions. You've hit the Roche density, congratulations, but you're still held up by gas pressure. You're still gene stable, thanks. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is that you can always look for clumps that are smaller, so, clumps so small that that effective uh, sound crossing time is short compared to the individual particle stopping time. And then there's no self-consistent regime in which you can treat it as one fluid. The two fluids really are decoupled. And in that case, you lose pressure support. Um, that's the good news. You're now genes unstable. The particles start to fall into one another. But the good news is not great. And it's not great because even though you are collapsing at this point, it's still a, quite a slow collapse because you're held back by gas drag, not by pressure, but by drag. So these particles, they don't free fall at their full free fall velocities. They're, uh, they very quickly attain terminal velocities, right? 
So the collapse times are not measured in uh, uh, ones of dynamical time. They're measured in thousands of dynamical times, which is still short compared to the disk lifetime, but is long compared to possible eddy turnover times of any turbulence which may or may not be present. Okay. So this is just one example of what's called secular gravitational instability. What do you get when you combine self-gravity with friction? What you get is collapse, but it's very slow. It's slowed down by all the gas that's in the way. Um, and uh, here's just one expression of that in this uh, recent paper by Andrew Uden. He's plotting here for millimeter-sized particles, for example, the maximum alphas, the maximum turbulence parameters, the maximum particle diffusivities that the system can tolerate for collapse to happen, <laughs> these maximum tolerable alphas are not very large, right? 10 to the minus 7 at a few AU. So that's the concern, is that there might be some turbulence which screws up the whole thing. And this remains a concern. So here's my last slide, just an outlook for uh, the future. Secular GI, dissipative GI. Here, secular means uh, dissipative, including friction, energy dissipative processes. What do you get when you combine self-gravity with friction? What you get is slow collapse, um, slowed by gas drag. It's been worked out in 2D. It'd be interesting to see what happens in 3D. That is, can we somehow accelerate secular GI in vertically settled disks? What is the nonlinear development of secular GI? Can you um, stick your way up to these marginally coupled bodies, which are so wonderful for the streaming instability. How thin is thin? Can you settle down to these thin dust layers that I've talked about, even when tau s is as small as 10 to the minus 3? The streaming instability, you can't get rid of it, but it is um, weakened by these small stopping times. The question is, is it weak enough for these dust layers um, to thin out? And maybe I'll end here with this final question. Um, how dead is dead? All of this is supposed to happen in disks that are, no, it's better to happen, it, it, it works best if, the, if there's no external source of turbulence. And so in these magnetically inactive zones, these magnetically dead zones that people talk about, really how large are the alpha parameters right at the midplane? This I think is an important question. And I'll stop there. We've got time for a few questions. Yeah, okay. You, you showed a, that that was a pretty interesting result. You showed where, you know, even when you get, uh, you know, moderately gravitationally bound things, they won't necessarily collapse. But I'm wondering if it's, you know, truly all hope is lost. Have you worked out how much a particle can grow itself before, you know, turbulence breed? distributes that material into a non-clumped fashion again? You know, can you actually you know, clump things to allow them to grow a little bit each time such that eventually you do finally reach a stage where they can then collapse under the next turbulent blump they f find? Yeah, so, so, so that's an interesting question. Um, you're talking about um, particle growth, particle-particle collisions. Um, they, for them to be important, you'd have to you know, uh, operate on these sorts of time scales. Right? So thousands of dynamical times. So the question is, how many particle collisions could you suffer um, in that time? Uh, it's possible, uh, you, you could work it out. Um, the hope would be that you can stick your way up to even larger things within that time, and they would achieve larger terminal velocities. And that would just accelerate the whole process. So yes, that is, that is an interesting um, direction. So I uh, would dispute your statement that the Kevin Helmholtz instability is inevitable. That only holds if you assume the, ma the magnetic field to, to vanish. And the magnetic field has um, um, an inverted role um, if you take it in a realistic form relative to the tradition for the last um, decades where the role of the magnetic field has, to, has been to inject um, magnetic rotation and instability. But that only happens if you have essentially zero average field. And through the last uh, year, since last October or so, a number of papers have come out pointing out that if you have a, an average background field, it tends to suppress the MRI. And therefore, the um, consequence of a magnetic field is to suppress turbulence rather than to, um, to stimulate it. 
No, uh, yes, I appreciate that. It is true you can suppress the kelvin helmholtz instability if the field is strong enough. You can use the tension to, um, to uh, keep the parcels from in, uh, exchanging one another in altitude. That's possible. You need a pretty strong field, and the main concern I have with that way of stabilizing the flow is um, non-ideal MHD effects, right? There's dust. These layers are incredibly dust-rich. Um, this is a question I had actually for your talk. Um, what are the fractional ionizations? Here, in these mid-planes, they're tiny. I think ohmic dissipation will kill you down at the mid-plane, is my short answer. So for that reason, I'm not worried about magnetic fields in this context. Okay, and there's one last super duper quick question up the back. Actually, just more of a comment. Um, one of the things that the large-scale exoplanet surveys have told us now is that we see planets not only around metal-rich stars and solar metallicity stars, but also metal-poor stars, stars with heavy elements, abundances several times less than the sun, and also uh, among low-mass stars, M dwarfs, whose disks may be significantly less massive, that we're less sure about. So any viable planet formation theory not only has to function for sort of the nominal or even the optimal cases, but these what one might call extreme cases where you're really deprived of solids. I have two, yeah, sure. Um, I have two comments to that. One is, um, you need to, one needs to distinguish between the host star metallicity and the disk metallicity, right? And the disk metallicity that I'm referring to here that's important for this problem is the local disk metallicity, not averaged over the entire disk even, but just averaged in height. And there can be relative drift processes where the dust drifts relative to the gas. Sean Andrews yesterday showed evidence for that, right, where the dust disks are systematically smaller than the gas disks, telling us that you know, in the inner portions of these disks, the metallicity can be supersolar. So you need to distinguish between the disk metallicity in this local, very local sense, from the star metallicity. And those, those two things could be completely different. I guess the second comment I would add is that there are correlations between planet frequency and even host star metallicity. So yes, there are planets around low metallicity stars, but the trend is that high stellar metallicity does favor planet occurrence. So the sign at least is right. Okay, can you please join me in thanking Eugene again?